Uh, the first thing you'll notice is I have a very strong Scottish accent. Um, you know, a lot of Americans and even English people are thrown by this. So I will, uh, I'll speak slowly and at least at the start, and I hope you adjust to it. I think you know, Dave's probably adjust to the Scottish accent uh, more easily than Americans, but we'll see. Um, th th this story began for me almost exactly a year ago. It was uh, May 31st. Uh, I was in the Guardian's New York office, and the US editor, Janine Gibson, called me across the newsroom and said, uh, I'd like you to go to New York, I'd like you to go to Hong Kong tomorrow. And uh, like any reporter, I said, sure. You, you just don't, if you're offered an assignment, you accept it. If you're offered an assignment in an exotic part of the world, then you're definitely going to accept it. And it turned into the biggest story of my life. Um, and it's had enormous consequences. It's had consequences uh, for the intelligence agencies in uh, the US and Britain and elsewhere. Uh, it's probably the biggest uh, leak in uh, Western intelligence this side of 1945. Uh, it's had consequences for the Guardian. We've come under a lot of pressure from the British government. Um, it's had consequences for the internet companies uh, and the way that we see uh, the, the balance between national security and privacy. And uh, it's had consequences for Edward Snowden, who's now stuck in Russia. Uh, how's the accent? <laughs> Comprehensible? Beautiful. Hey. I'll speak for about maybe 15 uh, minutes and then I'll take questions. And I'm quite happy to talk, but I'd rather hear what interests you. Uh, the, the, the two main catalysts in this story, the first was Laura Petraeus, who's a very brave American uh, documentary filmmaker, and she's done Courageous reporting from places like Iraq, um, but she doesn't trust the American authorities. She was constantly hassled by them. And so she chose to live in Berlin. Uh, and Glenn Greenwald, who was a Guardian columnist, uh, again uh, wrote about national security, uh, but, uh, he was based in Brazil. Snowden wanted to get in touch with. Uh, Glenn Greenwald. Uh, he didn't come to the Guardian, he was looking for Glenn Greenwald. Um, Glenn being Glenn and not very techy didn't reply. And it was Laura was the one that made this whole story work. Um, she, she took Snowden seriously. The day after Janine asked me to go to Hong Kong, myself, Glenn and Laura flew to Hong Kong and uh, as you said, the initial response, uh, Laura was very hostile towards me and uh, Glenn was kind of cool as well. And for a good reason. Uh, they'd been in touch with Snowden, but they didn't know what he looked like, they didn't know anything about him. And uh, they told Snowden at the meeting there would be two people. And if a third person turned up, they were scared that that would sort of scare them off and they wouldn't make contact. Um, but after 24 hours, uh, we became friends, we emerged, we developed into a coherent team with different talents. Uh, Laura's a filmmaker, and Glenn knew an awful lot more about surveillance than me, and uh, I brought the skills of a newspaper reporter. The first thing we had to do was establish whether Edward Snowden was real. When I left New York, I thought I'd just be going away for two days. I thought, this is a hoax. This guy isn't for real. Um, and when, we, when I sat down to interview him, when I heard the story, I thought, this is incredible. This guy is not for real. He was 29 years old. Uh, but he looks about 22 or 23. He looks like a student. 
And when we asked him about his life story, he said that he'd been, he'd worked, he'd trained for the US Special Forces. He wanted to fight in Iraq. He, uh, he broke both his legs in training so he couldn't continue with the Special Forces. He said he was a CIA, uh, he worked for the CIA in Geneva. Uh, then he said he worked for the National Security Agency in Japan. Then he worked for the National Security Agency in America. Then he worked for the National Security Agency in Hawaii. This seemed like fantasy to me. Um, and it was a bit over. We interviewed him for hours, and eventually we were persuaded because you get a sense of whether someone's lying. And uh, he, he produced lots of documentation, uh, basic things like his driver's license, and things that you wouldn't expect, like a diplomatic passport, and his, his CIA identity. He brought all this documentation to persuade us that he was for real. When you put that together, he started to give us leaked uh, documents from the NSA. And it was, all, it was, like, it was almost impossible to fabricate that level of detail. And so eventually we were persuaded, yeah, this guy is a real spy. And one of the problems we had uh, in the initial days was just communication. Um, you can't, can't phone up the editor and say, we'll get a real spy. Because, um, you know, we learned straight away that anything we said in Hong Kong, people could listen to. Um, before I left New York, almost as a joke, the Guardian US editor, Janine Gibson, said that if he's for real, send me a message saying, the Guinness is good. Uh, she knew that she knew me well enough that I'd be drinking Guinness and, uh, uh, and if he wasn't real uh, to say the Guinness is bad uh, so I sent a text the Guinness is good and everything the cover started after that it, that, that seems sort of flippant and jokey and that's, that's because at the time we thought this guy isn't for real so when we were in New York there was a sort of sense of uh, you could make a joke about it, but by the time we were in Hong Kong, we weren't joking anymore. We realised this was enormously serious. Every day we went to see Edward Snowden, we thought he wouldn't be there. We expected the CIA or the Hong Kong police to have snatched them. And the the document. After a few days of interviews, we published the first story. It's about mass surveillance in America, Verizon. Then we did one prism about the relationship with the internet companies, Facebook. One about White House cyber security policy. Uh, one about boundless informant, a system for of surveillance. And then on the Sunday, uh, there was a video of Snowden uh, saying, "Yes, it's me. Uh, I'm not." going to be an, an anonymous source, I'm going public. Uh, and then the day after that, he disappeared from Hong Kong and went underground. And there are lots of consequences as a result of this. Uh, just like The Guardian, we faced a lot of um, pressure from the British government and the British intelligence. Uh, they threatened legal action against us. Uh, there's a criminal investigation on their way. They went into the Guardian and destroyed all the hard drives, computer hard drives that contained anything to do with Snowden. We had to move all the documents to our office in New York. The British government said, well, your New York office is still uh, part of the Guardian, so we had to move them out there to the New York Times. There's more constitutional uh, safeguards there. Um, David Miranda, Glenn Greenwald's partner, was uh, arrested at Heathrow under the terrorism laws, and it's not finished yet. Um, more important uh, consequences is the uh, the debate that's taking place. Uh, 
I'm glad people, I think as a result of this debate, people are much more aware now than they were a year ago about A, the ability of the security agencies to put them under surveillance, but mainly how much information we voluntarily give away to Facebook and on Skype and in emails. Um, so I'm glad we're having uh, uh, this debate. About last autumn, uh, The Guardian and Glenn Greenwald and Lord Trias. Um, that's capability um, because of Facebook and Skype and uh, Google and uh, chat lines they were able to amass this fantastic amount of information on any individual that they, they wanted and there wasn't a corresponding uh, change in the political oversight or the judicial oversight uh, and that's the debate that's taking place in uh, America uh, and to a lesser extent in Britain. Uh, there is a, in Britain there hasn't been the same debate, uh, but there is an argument that uh, uh, the political oversight that exists at present is totally inadequate and uh, that there should be some change. Um, Just two more points. Uh, my big fear is that if there is another terrorist attack. May at present, last night, <coughs> the Guardian was isolated, uh, and Glenn Greenwald and Laura and others involved in this were toxic. Uh, now suddenly we've received prizes of bullets and poke and everything's fine. If there's another terrorist attack, and I'm sure there will be eventually, uh, then the mood may change again. They'll say the national Intelligence agencies will come out and say, well, it's because uh, you revealed all these details, you we weren't able to monitor the terrorists properly, and it's your fault. And maybe the mood changes again and we're toxic again. Uh, there is a real risk of that. And um, the final point is Edward Snowden himself. He never wanted to go to Russia. Uh, he was badly advised by WikiLeaks. Um, he's ended up there. Ideally, he would like to be in Western Europe. Um, if uh, Denmark would give him asylum or Germany would give him asylum, he would come here. Uh, I know that's not very likely given the governments that are in place at present. Um, and he'd much rather go back to America. And his lawyers there are working uh, to try and change the political climate, to try and change the mood in America. So, Perhaps you could do some sort of deal that would see him go back to America. But that doesn't seem very likely either. So uh, he seems to be stuck in Russia uh, for quite a long time to come. And for me, that's the unfinished, the main un unfinished part of this story, apart from the uh, debate, is the fate of Edward Snowden. He had the courage to uh, do this. Uh, he didn't even know if any journalists would come to Hong Kong. Uh, he knew that if the journalists didn't come, eventually the NSA security police and the uh, CIA would fight them. And it, it would all have been in vain. Um, he's reasonably pleased with what's happened. He's got, he wanted a debate. Uh, it's underway. 
he didn't do it for money. He hadn't done it for fame. He's kept the fairly low profile. Um, uh, he did it because he thought that the uh, US government's actions were unconstitutional and that somebody had to stand up and uh, disclose it. Um, so, I, mean, I wish there was someone in uh, Denmark or Germany. Uh, I don't think he would want to come to Britain. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm um, happy to take questions. <laughs>